As we think about our Veterans Day, it's, uh, it's an honor for us to have veterans. I think uh, those that have served uh, in our armed forces, both watching on, on, uh, li- on, on video and live here in a person, um, we appreciate you. In fact, uh, would you give a, a round of applause for those that have served? I appreciate them. <laughs> 
Veterans Day is, uh, is Wednesday, I know, uh, but we always want to never forget the service uh, to our country, those that have given, uh, given their time, their, their all. Some people have uh, given their, their whole lives, um, and others have just given sacrifice after sacrifice to serve, and it is a great honor. Um, and we have a great debt of gratitude to give, um, and that fits in with what we've been talking about. We're in the series now, Growing in Gratitude, and, and today actually the topic is uh, <clears throat> uh, Thanksgiving and God's protection, and that fits in hand in hand because it is the protection of our troops that have given us the freedoms that we enjoy. Um, and, and I know this week has been an unsettling week. Uh, I'm just going to acknowledge it right off the bat. It's been an unsettling week. I know that. Um, uh, for me, uh, and, and I probably watched too many news reports, um, I, I told Tracy after Tuesday, staying up too late, watching stupidity, um, I stayed up and watched too much of it, and I watched a little too much of it on the days afterwards, and then I made the decision that in our house, we're not watching any more of this nonsense. Um, God's in control, and he gives us the protection we need, but I do want to thank those troops that have served um, and are continuing to serve. I've got some students that uh, I worked with for years that um, uh, are serving uh, abroad, and, uh, and uh, I think of them often um, and what they do for our country, for our freedom, and we don't want to cry uh, I know our country is not what it has been in the past, but it's still a lot better than most countries are. Let's never forget that and the freedoms we've been given by God, too. Um, you know, I was thinking as we moved into today's uh, message, uh, uh, we are dealing, last week we talked about God's provision. By the way, thank you for those that have been in, involved in the, uh, the uh, praise challenge. Um, and, and I would continue to urge you on to do that, um, not just because preacher said to, but it's something you grow in. Uh, in this day where things may not go the way you want, um, it is tough, but uh, let's grow in gratitude by thanking God for daily providing things for us to praise him about. And so there's so many things. Uh, it's, sometimes I have a hard time just figuring out what I'm going to say. Um, I know that's hard to believe, but uh, I was thinking about this. When we come down to the idea of protection, I think everybody has, and, and if you're honest with me today, the common need we all have is we all have a need to have shelter or refuge from time to time. Um, in your life, there is something that has beaten you down or had you uh, fearful or had you um, under the gun, I guess. I, I hate to use those terms because uh, both literally and figuratively, um, we've gotten to the place where I think everybody would acknowledge somewhere along the line you felt attacked, you felt surrounded, you felt a little bit uncomfortable, and you just needed a place. If nothing else, go back to when you were a kid playing tag or, or, or whatever game you played, and there was always that home base, wasn't there? There was always that place of refuge, and so we've always sought that out, and more so in today's, uh, today's day and time. In fact, if you think about it, that's how our country was really formed, because we became that place of refuge uh, that, that so often they talk about, give us your, your poor and your tired and your huddled masses, um, we've become the, the refuge of the world, haven't we? And because of that, we've, we've been the beacon for liberty, too, and freedom. But I think more so on an individual base, um, I don't know about you, but sometimes I go through my week, and, and this is one of them. I came off this week, and it's, it, I think God works these things out for us ahead of time, because um, I already had the message prepared, but <laughs> I think, man, I just felt like I'd been surrounded this last week. I don't know about you. I felt like there was evil at, at play all week long. And I don't want to give you this, this whole thing, but today, uh, I, I just want to tell you that there is hope. Uh, I was thinking of that long line of songs. We're, we're going to be in the book of Psalms here in just a second. But um, I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy named uh, Augustus, um, and I want to make sure I get his name right because I always mess it up, a, a, Augustus Top Lady. That's his name. That's a weird name. Um, but he was British. That, that's part of the deal. He was born in 1740. And I don't know if you ever heard of him, but once I tell you what he did, you will go, you'll be like, oh, yeah. He was born in 1740 to a father who served in the Royal Marines of, of England. And his, his dad died shortly after his birth serving his country. His mom was poor and, and had a lot of difficulty raising him and his siblings. Um, but she was a godly woman, and she pointed him in the direction of God. And so at an early age, he surrendered to God. Uh, got saved, surrendered to God, and became a Christ follower and actually gave his life to become a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. At a very young age, he began studying God's word and letting God lead him, which was amazing. But all through his life, it was just difficulty after difficulty. He felt like persecution was always against him. Everything was attacking him. 
And what he learned to do during those times of difficulty is he would sit down and pen poetry, which became later hymns. And he would write some amazing hymns. You have to realize he died at the age of 38 of tuberculosis. But he had a profound effect on a lot of us because before he died, there's a story, and I don't know how, I've heard people say, well, that's just a fable. But the story was is that he was traveling back to his church after being out, and he was walking in the hills of uh, Burrington Combe, and actually he was walking in a gorge in Burrington Combe in, in some of the hills in England, and there was a terrible storm that came up and chased him. In fact, it was such a bad storm that in this gorge, he had to find shelter and hide because it was, it was life-threatening, the storm, how bad it was. And so he found a, a cleft in the rock, and there he, he hid himself in the storm. And while he was sitting there, he reached into what he had, his bag of stuff that he had. He pulled out an old playing card, of all things. And there he began to pen poetry, just like he always did whenever there was a life-threatening situation, anything bad. And he began to write what he was seeing and what God was moving him to do. And let me read you the words, because I think you'll, you'll hear these words and you'll realize what he wrote. He wrote this from his experience. Rock of Ages left for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I rise to worlds unknown and behold thee on thy throne. Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Written by Augustus Toplady, who you probably have never heard of until today, but what an amazing thing, and what it points out to is the fact that, and, and I want to get out of, out of the way, right off the top of the bat, the theme of what we're trying to get you to understand today. Today's, today's lesson that we should learn is what Augustus learned, is that if we're going to be able to make it in these times of fear, if we're going to be able to make it in these times of adversity, if we're going to be able to persevere, and, and I know we don't use that word a lot, but push through when all the world seems to be crashing down around us, when our views of life, uh, at least the views of Christianity, are being uh, marginalized, and when we feel like, God, are you there? What do we need to do to move forward? We need to be able to seek the Lord as our protector and provider. And that's what David knew. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Psalm 27 this morning. We're, I told you in the series we're going to be looking through various psalms. Um, and Psalm 27 is one of those treasure places because it's a, it's a psalm that David wrote. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about its, its writing. But um, David wrote in the midst of some of his greatest oppressions in life. And he turns the whole frown upside down kind of thinking going on the right way because he realized that if he was going to make it through the tough times of his life, he wasn't going to turn to anybody else. He wasn't going to turn to himself. He was going to have to turn to God as his protector and provider. And that's what we need to do. That's the whole idea. We, and not just turn to him. We need to seek God in the midst of all these problems and pressures of life, in the midst of crumbling political views and, and all the other things going on. We need to seek God as our protector and provider. And that's what David points out here. So if we want to read, if you'd read along with me or follow along, uh, it's on screen if you don't have a Bible with you. But Psalm 27, we're going to read the first six verses. David writes this. He says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? <laughs> Great verse. He says, the Lord is the stronghold of my life. Or, or you might have it in your Bible as the refuge but that's what he's getting across. The stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? Two rhetorical questions. Let me answer it for you, he says. Verse 2, when the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, <laughs> sounds like 2020, doesn't it? For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. 
at his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Now, Psalm 27 is odd. You say, why do we only read the first six verses? Because the whole thing's really good. Well, let me give you a little background into it. Psalm 27 is, is a psalm of courageous praise. And actually, most of the, most of the Bible uh, theologians would say this, that Psalm 27 was actually two different psalms that were written by David and sort of put together by whoever put them together. And so the first six verses, actually, what we have is a song of confidence in the Lord our God. And then verses 7 through 14, it's almost a different tone, but of the same kind of song of praise, a courageous praise, but it's a song of praise in the midst of trials and troubles. And so for today's sake, we're just going to deal with the first six verses because he asked some questions there that really apply to me in my life, especially in this last week, if you're honest with me. Maybe Maybe you're just really good about the way things are going, but in my world, everything seemed to be crashing down. In my world, everything doesn't seem to be going the way I want to go, and that's part of my problem. But David here, he understood the idea behind what's going on here. And let me ask you this question that I want you to consider as I I speak today. And this is the question that you need to answer in your heart. This is the question we need to face as we're looking into Psalm 27. What does it really mean for you, for God to be your refuge? What does it mean to you for God to be your refuge? That's the question you need to ask. And I'm not asking you to, to talk about it in, in such a way that you give me some, some platitudes or anything like that. What does it really mean when your world is crashing down on you, where do you go? And is it true that you can go to God? Because most of us, I tell you what we do is we go to ourselves and our deep thoughts and how we think things should be, and that's how we deal with them. That's what the problem lies in. David here had a serious situation. Now, most of the authors would tell you they didn't know exactly the situation uh, that David was in when he wrote these these psalms. But in Psalm 27, uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, uh, the Prince of Preachers, what he decided was Psalm 27 was probably written most likely during the time period of Saul's persecution upon him and the information that Saul had received from one Doeg. Now, there is another psalm that's written uh, that is decidedly about this, but he felt like this was on the time where Doeg, if you remember, Doeg was the guy who saw David get help from the priest, and uh, he got the sword and some bread and took off, and Doeg went back and told Saul, and then Saul ordered those priests all murdered, and their families murdered, and, and David felt badly about putting those men in jeopardy, but he realized how it was the evil man, Doeg, that was doing all the talking, and how he was an enemy of God, an enemy of David, and so David here in this situation David was faced with that, where do I turn for help kind of thing. Because the few people he had turned to help, in, in our eyes, the people of the world, these priests, when he turned to them, it cost them their lives. And, and I feel like that's where I'm at in my life sometimes. I try and figure things out. I turn to my reasoning. And that's what David had done. It didn't work. And I think what David is responding here in this situation is realizing that truth, that I don't turn to other people. I don't turn to myself when I need help if I'm going to push through my problems and all the attacks on me, then I need God to be my refuge, so I have to seek God as the protector and seek him as the provider for me. And that's what David's trying to get us to understand here. Now, first off, we we just have to, to, to deal with the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room says David acknowledged that there are enemies, aren't there? I mean, maybe you're sitting here and you're like, I got nobody hates me. I got nobody that's against my view of life. I got no one that thinks anything. And maybe you're that person. That's great. But David, God's man, he had a lot of people after him. In fact, if you look through Psalm 27 as we just read it, you would notice right off the bat in verse number 2, it says there were wicked people that were advancing against him. He went, and not just advancing against him, they were prepared to devour him. He goes on and says there are enemies, there are foes. He even goes and says so much as not just a few people, there's an army camped around me. In fact, he ends that verse by saying that, in verse, uh, actually verse 3, he says, War is getting ready to break out, not against his nation, his way of life or anything. He says, against me. War is declared on me. <laughs> and I don't know if I've ever gotten to that point where, like, it's, it wars on my life now. But that's how David felt in this. And, and I think the first thing we have to realize as we go through life is realize, if you don't think you have adversaries, you do. But I think so often we get the adversaries wrong. I see this happening on on social media. I see this happening in politics and all these things 
our adversaries are not other people. <laughs> Paul pointed this out to us. He said, we, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. And when we do, we're hurting other people because God loves those people. He died for those people. We fight against principalities and powers of darkness. We fight against people that, uh, that uh, we fight against uh, demons and, and, and their hierarchy. We don't fight against other people. Those other people, just so you know, they are pawns. They are prisoners of war. You could say it that way. They are held captive in their lives under the control of evil doers, evil powers. They are pawns in the war that Satan is waging against God, attacking us. They're not our enemies. In fact, our job is to help free them. That's, and by the way, you and I are both on that team for a while. We were slaves to sin is what Paul points out. And David, David, he says, there's a lot of them. They're adversaries. They're foes. They're enemies. They are at war. They have circled around me. They've got me surrounded in my life. That's how he felt. He was just desperate. But he wanted to realize, first of all, that there are enemies. And we need to understand that. We always will be. Jesus Christ said, hey, if you're in the world and you're one of my followers, you will have people that don't like you because they didn't like me. But he says, be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. And that's the hope we have. And so let's not leave ourselves despondent because that's what David realizes here. See, even in the midst of enemy attacks, David, and, and this is what I appreciate about, so much about David, even in the midst of all the problems of life, David does not get sidetracked here. You know I do all the time. I get sidetracked left and right, but David didn't. David was set in what he was doing, and that's how he makes it, because he learned to seek the Lord as his protector and provider. Now notice in verse number one, he names God three different ways, gives three different descriptions of God here in verse number one. He starts off by saying, the Lord is my light. Do you know that this is the only time in the Old Testament, the only reference in the Old Testament, that God is called directly the light. Now, there are times it talks about his countenance being light, and other, you know, there's, there, he's surrounded by light. But this is the only place in the Old Testament you're going to find it said that God is light. You have to go all the way into the New Testament before you see it again, where God is described as light. In fact, John, I think Jesus' most beloved disciple, John is the guy who says it most often. He says it in his gospel account there in John chapter 1, verses 4, 5, and 9, that he talks about, hey, light came in and the darkness couldn't comprehend it um, because men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. He tells, tells us all those things. But he gives us a clearer picture over in his, his letter in 1 John chapter 1. He says this in 1 John chapter 1, verse number 5. He says, this is the message that we've heard from him, that is Jesus Christ, and declare to you, God is light, and this is so important, in him there is no darkness at all. Now, that's a no-duh statement, but here's what we need to understand. When, when David says, the Lord is my light, you know what he's saying? He's saying here something that's so confident. It's light that leads us, light that directs us, light that guides us, light that warms us on cold days, although today is not one of those days. Um, but it is light that shines brightest in the darkest times. And what John points out in his letter in 1 John 1, he says, hey, you know what? There's no darkness in light. And that's once again, is a duh. And what David is saying here to help him through his dark trials and times is that if God is light, you know what light can never have in its presence? Darkness. Light always beats the dark. Light always defeats darkness. That's what David's saying. No matter how bad my life is, no matter how surrounded I am, no matter how overcome I am with the problems of life, the difficulties you face on a day-to-day -day basis, you need to remember, first of all, the Lord is my light, and I don't have to fear anything. Because that light will drive out the darkness. Doesn't that help? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I was a little scared of the dark when I was younger. Still am a little bit, but uh, we'll, we'll get with that some other time. But <sighs> have you ever known a, a child that was scared of the dark and they had to have a nightlight on? Isn't it amazing what a little light does? A little light dispels the darkness. And that's a principle of God. You know, every time you turn on a nightlight or some kind of light in the darkness, you know what you're doing is you're telling people about God because God is light and he dispels the darkness in our lives. 
That's what David is saying here. I don't have to be afraid. They're going to look awfully scary in the dark, but when we turn on the light, God's light shines on us, and he dispels all darkness. There is no darkness in him is what John said. That is so encouraging. He goes on to say, not that he's just light, but he's also my salvation. Now, he wasn't talking like salvation in the term that we use in church world. The word in Hebrew for salvation really is deliverer. He is my deliverer. And, and, and I, right away, as soon as I read that, you know what I was thinking is what Paul, uh, Paul in the New Testament, what he glued it together with. In Romans chapter 8, Paul makes a great question that you should always remember. Maybe you need to write it down somewhere and put it on your wall, uh, on your fridge or mirror or wherever. But he, he asks this question to help us remember something that's so important. Paul said this, if God is for us, who can be against us? That's what David's saying. When David says, the Lord is my light and my deliverer, my salvation, who in the world, God's for me, who can beat God? Yet we get worried that politicians can. We get worried that political systems can. We get worried that Antifa or whatever rioters can. We get worried that socialists or communists or crazies or whoever can. And it wrecks our lives because, once again, when the problems come, the attacks come, what are we doing? We're turning to our own thoughts. And David says, not me. It's the light. It's the salvation. That's who does all this stuff for me. And then the third description, he goes on to say, the Lord is the stronghold of my life, the refuge in place of rest, the renewal of hope. And I love the fact that he gives us that refuge. And David, once again, returns us to the thought, when I have problems, when I feel attacked, when I feel everything on the world is coming down on me, where do I go? I go to the light that dispels darkness. I go to the deliverer who takes me away from those evil people. But I go to my refuge, my strong tower, which is the whole plot today, isn't it? We are to seek the Lord as our redeemer and our, uh, our, our, uh, our provider. He's our refuge. That's what David was trying to get across. And he says there in verse number two, he says, when. I, I underline that word in my Bible. When. He didn't say if. He didn't say maybe. He said when the wicked advance. When. If you're not prepared, you're going to go under. I'm just telling you. I think the surprises of life really hurt us the most. And David here says, hey, you know what? I'm not going to be surprised anymore. I, I, I'm not going to be surprised when people say bad things about me. I'm not going to be surprised when things get on me. I'm not going to be surprised when people knife me in the back. I'm not going to be surprised when good people walk out on me. I'm not going to be surprised when things don't happen the way I think they should happen anymore. Because when the wicked advance, because they are advancing. It's their thing. But it's not something that's going to kill me because he says, uh, and by the way, when he says that statement there, advance against me to devour me, the picture, the word picture there in the Hebrew is the picture of a crouching lion sneaking up on its prey. I remember one time uh, I was in Africa, and, and, and it's so rare to see. Uh, you probably do a better chance of getting to see it on YouTube. But one time I actually got to see a lion spring the trap and, and go after a zebra. And uh, it was cool. It really was. Um, we were sitting there, because you have to wait and wait and wait. They don't, lions don't eat every day, you know that. They eat like once every week or so. And a lot of times they eat in, in a place that's dark and you don't get to see it a whole lot. But this time, we saw this big, huge, huge herd of zebra, and we saw the lionesses. They're actually the hunters. The lionesses out there creeping in the tall grass. And then all of a sudden, we saw one of the zebra take off. And it's not long before they all take off. And that means that lion is going. And the next thing you know, the lion jumped on the back of that zebra and swipes, it swipes its, with, its, with its hind legs, it sort of swipes at the hind legs of the uh, zebra to sort of knock it down. And you've got to realize, zebra is not the size of a horse. It's about the fattest horse you've ever seen in your life. They're huge, mammoth-sized uh, beasts. And this zebra, <coughs> this, this lioness is on it. Uh, it's got its claws dug into its back, and it is now grabbing, biting at the neck to take it down its jugular, and um, once it got it down, that was it. Um, it, was just a, it was just a nasty thing, and the rest of the lionesses came over, and they, they just tore it up, gashed it, and it was just amazing to watch as you see that happen. And that's how David's describing his day. When he says when, 
And I don't know if you've ever had those kind of days or weeks or months or years. 2020 may feel like that year to you. But that's what David was going through. He says, hey, when they advance, when they jump on your back and they're trying to bite out your jugular vein, they're trying to choke you out, they're trying to knock you down, when the enemy, and I think what Peter said was so true, that, that Satan as a roaring lion, he's, he's walking about seeking whom he can devour. That's the whole worry there that we have. But David's saying, hey, even that lion isn't big enough to beat the lion of the tribe of Judah. God is still capable of taking him out. And he goes on in verse number three, and he helps us understand that faith puts strength to our courage. Uh, he says, even then, as he finishes that verse three, even then I will be confident. And, and I realize this. Do you realize this? Confidence is the child of experience. Confidence is the child of experience, Right? You ever done something for the very first time? I was thinking about Ben and Holly. First time parents, man. Everything's new. <laughs> oh, man. All those first times, they're fun, but they're scary at times. Am I right? You get a little scary sometimes. And uh, they're probably like, well, she wouldn't talk about this. But um, everybody does the whole new, the first time you do something, it can be a little scary. It's exhilarating. Now, I'll tell you that. First time you have a child, it's scary. Second time, not so much. Third time, yeah, you saying here, as he, as he goes through this, he's saying, hey, you know what? I have been attacked before, and I have survived. I have had bad days before, and I have survived. Hey, you know what? In fact, think about David and his, his whole testimony. As he stands there before King Saul, he's getting ready to go out in the battlefield against Goliath. What does he tell da uh, Saul? He says, you know, when I was a kid, <laughs> he's still a kid, but he goes, a couple years ago, back in the day, back in the day, here's a teenager telling him that, back in the day, I had a bear come on. And he thought he was bad news, tried to take some of my lambs out of my, my sheepfold, and I took him out because God was with me. And I had a lion try the same thing, and I took care of him. And the same way I took care of those, I'm going to take care of this giant fly for you. And it's really not because of me, it's because of God. And here's what I'm saying once again, confidence is the child of experience. And you know what? It's great. All the trials, all the problems that you've gone through, they should be able to give us better courage in our faith because we have been experienced in knowing that God will get us through this. Now, David didn't say, hey, he's going he's to give me riches, he's going to give me honor, he's going to give me all these things. David says, he's going to get me through this. I can be confident in that. And his confidence wasn't in himself and his abilities. His confidence was the fact that God had delivered him before, and that is the amazing truth of Psalm 27. Which leads us to, once again, as we look at this, I got three prayers this week that I want you to pray in your life when you're threatened with these trials. And these are the main points. And I'm going to frame them as prayers once again. And our prayer after we read through verses 1 through 3 should be this. Lord, be my refuge and shield me and <clears throat> from my enemies today. Lord, be my refuge and shield me from my enemies today. That's what David would tell us we should be praying as we're trying to seek God as our provider and protector. Lord, be my refuge. Hey, I don't have to go out and take care of the giant because God, I want you to be my refuge. And I want you to be my refuge and my shield. Shield me from those enemies because they're real in my life. And I don't want to act like they're better than you, God, because you are the light. You are my, my strong tower. You are the refuge. So we need to pray this on a daily basis. How do we get through to per persevere towards this point? We should be praying, Lord, be my shield, be my refuge for my enemies today. In verse 4, as we continue on, David starts off in verse 4, he says, one thing, <laughs> one thing. You know what's great about one thing? David was solely focused on what he needed to do in God. He wasn't divided in his attention. In fact, divided aims, divided attention tends to distraction, weakness, and disappointment. And you know what one of the biggest problems I find in my life, and maybe it's true of yours, is I have spiritual ADD. Yeah. <laughs> I think there are so many distractions today that I get distracted from what I'm supposed to be with God, distracted from what God's doing in my life, distracted from the greatness. I think politics can be one of the greatest distractors in our time right now from what God wants us to do. He doesn't care about us getting political. I know it's hard to say, but when we were all political this last week, but I want you to know, David says, hey, you know what? 
I have enemies. I have adversaries. They're trying to jump on my back and tear out my jugular. They've surrounded me. They've even waged war against me. And yet one thing, one thing, and that's what kills me in this. Because when you talk about the one thing, under the circumstances that David has just told us, I would think that David would have said, hey, you know what? My desire is for rest. That's my one thing. Or my desire is for safety. Or my desire is for uh, riches or reward or discomfort. My desire is for better family relationships. Maybe, maybe I just want to settle down and have a house and, and, and be able to do what I want to do. But that's not what David says his one thing is. See, that's what makes David that great guy. Because David has a heart set on the presence of God and he leaves everything else behind. He says, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only, hear that, that one, one thing language, that center language he has? And here's what he realizes, that holy desires lead to resolute action. Holy desires lead to resolute action. David says, you know what? I need to set my desires not on what I'm getting today, not on this earth and all the things here, not on who wins this battle because there's going to be another one four years from now, not on who's on the throne of Israel or the throne of America, not what the economy's bringing me, not about my health and safety. He says, you know what? My desire is holy actions for God. That holy desire is going to lead to resolute action in David's life. And then he uses some language here. If you look in verse 4, he says something that sounds very familiar. He says, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And I was thinking as I read that, doesn't that sound familiar? Sounds a lot like Psalm 23, doesn't it? Psalm 23, 6, David said, Surely a goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, they come off very similar, but I want to point out a difference here. Psalm 23, David is talking about his eternal existence with God. He's talking about how God is his eternal destination. As he finishes it out, how he's going to live with God. And so there his request is that he can live with God forever as obviously stated. But that's not what he says here in verse number 4 of chapter 27. He says, I want to live and dwell in the house of the Lord, not forever, but all the days of my life. And that's different. The, the, there's a huge difference here. What David is asking is not for eternal ramifications this time. He's asking now for present application. He's saying, you know what? I don't want to wait for heaven. I want God's presence every day of my life. And you know what he's trying to get us to understand is that if we just realize God can help us through our problems when we feel attacked, when we feel threatened, when we feel down, how do we get past those problems? We go to God because God wants to be with us every day. But remember what my spiritual ADD does. It keeps me distracted. And David says, you know what? Purposeful living, purposeful living brings me into the presence of God. And so my, my actions, my desires need to be set every day on God. That's what hopefully this praise challenge was going to do for us. We were going to get more focused on God every day and what he's doing for us that we spend more time with him and less on the distractions of this world. That's the obvious truth. And that's what David's trying to get us to understand, which leads us in verse 4 to our second prayer, our second point of today, Lord, redeem me with your love and restore me with your peace. That's what David's prayer is. And that's what our prayer should be. Not just, hey, uh, shield me and uh, be my refuge and shield me from my enemies today, but Lord, redeem me with your love <laughs> and, and restore me with your peace. And you know what? I think those are the two things that we forget in the midst of being attacked, don't we? We forget about the love of God. That's what, that's what Romans chapter 8 is all about. Because <laughs> Paul goes on in chapter 8 and he tells us what can separate us from the love of God. And he goes through a list of things. If you haven't taken time to read it lately, when you get down, just reminding yourself what the love of God does for us. That's amazing. There's nothing that can separate us from that love of God. That's how, how great it is. And so the prayer here should be, Lord, redeem me with your love because the love of God conquers all things. That's the greatest of things, isn't it? And not just that, but restore to me your peace because when I get distracted by all the things of this world, by political systems, by economic disasters, by coronavirus and all the rest of the things on a day-to-day -day basis, I get carried away with the cares of this world. Remember Jesus tells us in that parable of the seed and the sowers that the seed that, that gets thrown into the weeds gets choked out by the weeds. 
And those weeds represent the cares and concerns of this world. And that what happens in our lives? We get weak. And we let things overcome us. And if we want to be overcomers, David says, hey, you know what? One thing. Solitary focus. Let's make sure we have it the right thing. Go on in verse number five. As David goes into our third, third and final prayer here, David says, for in the, the day of trouble, and that's another reference once again to remind us there is a day of trouble coming. It, it, it may be here now, but there's a day of trouble for each one of us, and maybe it's some more days than others. But he says, for in the day of the trouble, and this is where he reminds himself, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent. And, and David's here in this verse five, he, his desire was that he was secure in that hour of peril, but uh, what he paints here is his picture. As he talks about this, he says, he's keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in his sacred tent. And, and what you have to picture in the, um, in the, in the times of, of kings where they war, went to war, as their army would camp out, and in the center there would be a tent, and that tent would be the tent of the king, the most important person. And so David here... He camps in that, uh, he says, God has called me into his tent, his royal pavilion. Uh, you go into the Old Testament, what you find is God sets up the, the, the children of Israel to move. He assigns them certain ways they're going to camp. And in the center of their camp, in the center of their camp was the tabernacle. That was God's holy tent. And so David, you remember David didn't, he never saw the temple completed. David was never around for a temple. So when he talks about this sacred tent, he's saying, you know what? Nobody's allowed in that tabernacle unless you're the high priest only one time, and you've got to be really sacred to be able to do that. But I'm going to be invited to be in the presence of God's holy royal tent every time. That's what I want. I want to be in the presence of God because that helps me overcome because no one can walk into the presence of God. No enemy can show his face there, and that's what David's trying to get us to see. He set me up on that. And... and, and God, what, what, what he's trying to reinforce with this is that God will give me his best shelter in the worst of danger. God will give me his best shelter in the worst of danger. And that's what you need to realize. When things go upside down, you don't have to turn to your fears and worries. Don't let them overcome you. Because God will give us his best shelter in times of our worst danger. And, and I was talking to somebody this last week, and, I, and he was talking about the fact that his political, uh, his political party didn't win or wasn't looking like it was going to win, and there was so much dishonesty and things like that going on, and he was, he, he was just so upset about it, and, and, and another guy looked over and said, hey, God is more glorified when we have evil reigning because we can be the light of God's word during this time. And I thought, wow, that's a, that's a good statement because we never think of it that way. And that's what he, David's saying. Hey, you know what? In the darkest hour that I have, God is still the light. God is my salvation. He's my deliverer. He's my strong refuge because he's going to save the best shelter, his royal pavilion, in times of the worst danger. In verse 6, he goes on to finish it out. He says, then, and I love this, because when, when you talk about what David says after this, David, what he's doing, he's by faith so sure of victory. He's not cocky. He's confident. He is so sure of victory in God over all those who have threatened him, who have harassed him, who have waged war on him, that he has arranged in his own heart what he would do <laughs> when his foes lay powerless before him. That's what he says there. If you look at it, verse 6, he says, then my head will be exalted. <laughs> That's talking a little smack there. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, if you ever read the, the story of David and Goliath, Goliath comes out there and, and says some mean things about God, Israel, and even David. And David waits for him to get done, and this little kid, talking some major smack, he says, hey, I didn't even bring a sword out here, because once I take you down, I'm going to go over and I'm going to pull your own sword out, and I'm going to cut your head off with your own sword, and those birds that are up in there, they're having a feast on your flesh today, because my God is bigger than your God. And that is just trash talking great, but that's faith talking, and we have a theological term for that, it's called provenial praise. Provenial praise is when you praise God for things that haven't happened yet, but you act as if they have, right? It's something that's so hard to do. It's, it's before you pray about it, I'm going to thank God. In fact, you don't ask for a prayer request before you praise God for its answer. Isn't that crazy? 
Hey, God, we thank you that you are going to deliver us from evil men and evil times, and here's what's going to happen. My head is going to be exalted above my enemies who have surrounded me right now, who are camped out there. Hey, they're still a viable threat to me physically, but because God is going to beat them down, I am going to have my head exalted. I'm going to be lifted up. David is talking some smack. And then what's going to happen, he says, at God's sacred tent, that tabernacle, I'm going there because I'm going to shout some joy. <laughs> I'm going to be excited here. David is pretty excited. He says, you know what? You have no power over me. There is no fear in my foes when God is on my side. And that leads us to that third and final prayer that we need to realize that we should pray, Lord, shelter me and strengthen me in your mighty presence. And that's what God does in his presence. Shelter me and strengthen me in your mighty presence. Because when it comes down to it all, here's the bottom line once again. What should we be doing? Seek the Lord as your protector and provider. Don't turn to your own ways. So many times, fear gets the best of me in my life because I'm trying to figure things out. I'm trying to solve the problem. I'm trying to come up with a solution. And that's not what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to seek the Lord as my protector and provider. And I'm just admitting today as the pastor, man, Sometimes that's hard to do because I want to figure things out. I, I, I have a need to figure things out. I want to solve my problems for my family. I want to solve the problems of my life. And God says, no, you don't. I want to be your light. I want to be your deliverer, your salvation. And I want to be your strong tower. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. That's what David said in one of the other Psalms. And he said, when things get bad, the righteous run to it and are safe. So where are you safe today? Where are you running so often we run to political people, we run to economic, we run to our jobs, we run, we're looking for relationships to help us out. If I only had a husband, I only had a wife, if I only had kids, if I only had this, I only had that, look for a job. If I only had a job that paid X number of dollars, <laughs> people in Florida, they voted for $15 an hour minimum wage. That's crazy. They're going to find out the cost of living goes up when the minimum wage goes up too. It doesn't make any sense. But we think those are the things that are going to make our life better. Life doesn't get better on things. It gets better on a relationship. David said, hey, if I could just have one thing, be you, God. So when was the last time you said, hey, God, just you. That's all I want. Maybe you're listening today and you're not a Christ follower. I would just say this. You need to ask yourself, is my life better now on my own terms, the way things are going? Or would it be better if the king of the universe was in my presence, and he had my back. I can tell you the answer to it, because I've experienced it. Experience has created the courage I need to go through in the problems of life, and that's what we have to realize. Let me have every head bowed and every eye closed. God's presence in our life is the most powerful thing we can have, and it's the most important thing we have. But unfortunately, there's only two teams you can be on. If you, if, you, if you listen today, you realize that. It comes to a conclusion, and I hope you understand that. There's no middle ground, no neutral. There's no independence when it comes to God. You're either on one side or the other. And it's not about a political party or, or beliefs. I'm just telling you today. What it comes down to is acknowledging Jesus as he is my Savior and Lord, or he's not. He's either friend or he's foe. And so as we look to this invitation time, as your pastor, let me invite you. If you're listening online, let me invite you. Today's the day that we get to, to make a choice. And it's not a political choice, it's an economic choice. It's not a relationship choice other than the relationship with God. And everybody gets to make it. Some of you, for the very first time, maybe you need to make the decision on your relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never moved towards him. Maybe you've never run your life's race having God in control. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, today's the day because you don't want to be an enemy of God. That's what the Bible tells us. You're either friends with God or you're enemies of God. I was an enemy of God for a while in my life. And that's not going to work out because in the end, the enemies of God, they can't beat God. He's the creator. And in the end, I've read to the end, and you know what it says? God wins. Don't you want to be on a winning side? I think we all want to be on the winning side. Most of us here today, though, we have a relationship with Jesus Christ taken care of. 
but I want, I want you to talk about your spiritual ADD today. What is distracting you from being in the presence of God? What fear, what foe has got you so encircled in your life? Has got you so depressed? Has got you so scared? Has got you so anxious that God can't be your light? That he can't be your deliverer? That he's not your strong tower, your refuge? David said there's no reason. There's no reason because experience has taught me this, that God is faithful. But I think we let our relationships, we let our possessions, we let, our, we let a lot of things distract us from God. We fit God in when we have time for him, but that doesn't work. Because sometimes we get overcome by the fears of foes who've waged war on us. Hey, you want to get through it? Realize that God is our mighty protector today. We're so thankful for our veterans who have helped free us, helped secure our freedom over the years. And even now we're doing that. We thank them and thank some of you for doing that. But there's a greater enemy. The enemy is called sin. It's not even the devil. The greatest enemy of our life is sin. The Bible tells us that sin, that desire to do the wrong thing, to do our own way, to go our own way, as, as Isaiah put it, like sheep who've wandered away from God. He said, all we like sheep have wandered away. There's nobody who's done good. There's nobody who seeks after good things. So apart from God, we have no hope. And the only way we can get back to God and back into that right relationship is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, your Savior, we, we ask you to do that. But maybe, Christian, it's been a long time since you've rekindled that relationship. Maybe you've gotten to the point where you read your Bible when you get a free moment to, but you rarely get a free moment to because you put everything else in front. Maybe you put your job first. Hey, hey, it's great to come in and tell the preacher how many hours you worked this week, but how many hours did you read your Bible this week? That would be a better thing to tell the preacher, right? You don't even need to tell me. Hey, it's great that you're hardworking, but you know what? God doesn't put you down on a scale and say, hey, the hard workers, they're better than the, the... He wants a relationship. That's what he wants. So once again, in this invitation time today, in just a moment, we're going to sing a verse of invitation. Hey, what's got you distracted? What's got you overcome? Because nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. He wants it. He wants it. And through that, you can have victory. I want victory in my life, and I want it for you too. So as we journey down that road of life, our goal is to help us move forward with Jesus, and that's what we're trying to do today. We should be thanking him as our protector. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for these, your people. Thank you for your word that is so powerful. And for the testimony of those that have gone on, like David, who wasn't a perfect man at all, but he learned the secret and significance of having you in his presence as his provider and his protector. And so last week we thanked you for providing, but this week we want to thank you for protecting us. God, I pray that you'd work in the hearts and lives of our people today here, those that are listening online, that we would be different, that we would mature and grow up and not be distracted by the, the trappings of this life. God, help it to reflect in our prayer life because we pray so many things about our needs and our wants, but we forget, fail to pray about your kingdom and your desires. So help us to stop worrying about elections and move forward with your kingdom because yours is the honor and the glory. Thank you for providing that freedom on the cross of Calvary. Just as our servicemen and women have provided freedom here in our country, we thank you for providing freedom from sin, from guilt. Help us to be victorious in our lives. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing a verse of invitation. I encourage you during this time, you don't have to sing if you don't want to, but during this time, you do need to deal with your relationship with God. What's the Holy Spirit talking to you about today? Won't you take advantage of this time and deal with it now as we sing? Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's bound outpoured,
Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, uh, well, let me start it this way. Uh, welcome to North Carolina, where we go from last week, it was so rainy and, and just a gloomy day, to free mornings at the beginning of the week, and now the youth pastor wears his Hawaiian shirt on the next Sunday, uh, because I just want to make fun of it. Uh, so... Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, uh, so much going on uh, the next couple weeks. I, I do want to uh, just take a few minutes. Uh, first of all, uh, if you haven't started the praise challenge that, that Pastor Bill put out there uh, last week, uh, go ahead and, and jump on board with that. I tell you, I, I want to. I just want to thank God for those that are that are being a part of it. Uh, me and Heather had a long discussion yesterday about just all the negativity and everything that you see on Facebook and on all the social media platforms, you see it. And so when I, you know, flip it over and I see uh, some of y'all making uh, and being very diligent as you go through the week with the praise challenge, that's helped so much. Uh, so I, I thank God for y'all. And, and if you haven't done that yet, whatever social media platform you're on, it doesn't matter. Uh, just... Uh, uh, hashtag praise challenge and, and, and what are you thankful for uh, and I'm thankful for each and every one of y'all today uh, as far as uh, I do have a, a card uh, that we were given uh, it's from the Gideons that was here just a couple weeks ago um, thank you so much for supporting him uh, supporting the Gideons uh, what an important ministry uh, that is we gave just over $300 uh, with that love offering that morning uh, so thank you so much uh, for that and supporting that uh, ministry. Uh, as far as other ministries in the area, don't forget the food pantry uh, items. And I encourage you, especially as we get into the Thanksgiving time, uh, if you haven't brought any food pantry items in, uh, bring those in, uh, especially as you're doing your Thanksgiving shopping. You know, buy an extra of whatever you're getting so you can get to the food pantry so they can put those items in there. Uh, also, don't forget tonight, uh, we'll be continuing with our Bible study, so make sure you're here for that. Uh, and then I have been told that there is a finance meeting next Sunday after service. Uh, finance meeting after next Sunday service. And if you are a ministry lead here within the church, uh, uh, they're putting the budget together. So if you know amounts or what you want to put into the budget for that ministry, if you'll let one of those know that's on the finance committee, uh, and if you don't know who that person might be, just see Alan and he'll direct you to the right person. Or he might be that right person. It's, he's that right person. Just give it to him. Uh, I volunteer you. <laughs> but no, don't forget the finance uh, meeting next week for that and, and the budgeted items. If you have those, uh, make sure you let them know. I have a video to show you just here in a moment, but, but before we do that, uh, uh, we're entering a time of the year where we start collecting uh, for Lottie Moon. Lottie Moon, uh, uh, 
if you just go by the missionary, uh, she was uh, born in 1840, uh, Southern Baptist through and through, and, and she took her mission overseas over to China, and throughout the year, she has become a legend. She has become a myth uh, uh, with the work that she has done. But we need to remember that that as we collect for Lottie Moon, yes, it's great to remember her and what she did and what she started, but never forget the individuals that are in the mission field that are across the world. Here in Thailand, there are so many people who don't know God, and no one they know knows God. Thai people have a desperate desire to get rid of the sin that they know they have. They're, they're going to the temples and they're taking money and gold and flowers and anything they can do that they think is good that might erase the sin that they know that is inside them. My calling to be a doctor and calling to be a missionary came on the same day. When a missionary came and spoke at our church, he said the line, the saddest thing I've seen after 35 years on the mission field is children sick and dying because there's no doctor to care for them. And it was a, light, a lightning bolt through my soul. And I said, okay, God, I'll be a medical missionary. Our ministry here takes mobile clinics all over the country of Thailand. Church planners call me up and say, I'm trying to start a new church where there's never been one, would you come and help me? Medicine is just a means for me to share the gospel with those who have no other access. When I talk about how to take care of their physical needs, it's just so easy for them to see when I start talking about their soul that they need a savior as well. And American churches have partnered with me in that. And they have sent me short-term mission teams that come with me for about a week every month. And we go out and do mobile clinics all over the country. Without the churches coming alongside me, I cannot do what I do. In general, people here do not like talking about spiritual things. But on mobile clinic, we can talk to 100 people in a day, 200 people, 300 people in a day that will come to mobile clinic and there we can share Christ with so many people at one time. It makes mobile clinic a great avenue for sharing the gospel. The point of mobile clinics is to start churches, groups of Thai believers that will go on to grow people in their new faith, to disciple them in their understanding of who Christ is, and to grow them together into groups that will become churches. There's a lot of things that money can't buy. Being able to be here, and see God praised where he has never been praised before. That is a dear joy. Seeing souls saved in areas where no one has ever known God before. Watching them grow in their faith and lead others to faith. And watching them grow together into churches. Seeing churches start where no one has ever worshiped God before. Money can't buy that. So if, you, if you've heard the name Lottie Moon over the years, uh, I, I'm not going to dive deep into her history, uh, but if you've heard that name, uh, I encourage you, if, if you don't know much about her, to do the history lesson on that and, and read up on her. Uh, but the other part of that is the IMB. IMB, that's the International Mission Board. Uh, and to be honest with you, they're, they're the ones that disperse the money, but that last phrase that they put on there is the most important. Uh, yes, Lottie Moon's important to this ministry. Yes, the IMB is important as far as getting the money there. But the most important part is the missionaries that are on the field. And every dollar that we give uh, to this mission, to the, to, the, to the Lottie Moon, goes directly to the missionaries. Now, now, the Southern Baptist Convention, they budget in the money for salaries of those that are, that are working in and, and are dispersing the money, but 100% of the money that we give as a church goes directly to the missions, goes directly to that missionary uh, that is on the ground, that is in the field, that is talking to those folks, that is, that is sharing the gospel with these folks. It 100% goes to that person. Uh, that is in the field. Uh, so, and that's that's what we 
uh, are striving towards as we as we enter. Uh, I think it's four weeks in December that we're going to be doing this. I encourage you to start today and pray towards what God is leading you to give. Uh, where is he leading you? Uh, and, and, and listen to that and, and follow that and give towards that. With that said, uh, as we finish up today, as we uh, close with our, our celebration of our offerings and tithes, I do encourage you to continue to, uh, to give faithfully. Uh, like we've talked about for the last several weeks. And don't forget that whether you drop it in the bucket or you use tithely, uh, uh, let me ask a technical question, uh, Heather. Uh, when it comes to tithely, uh, are we able to give to the Lottie Moon? And you can earmark it through that, and, and that way it goes to the right place. Awesome. See, that's why I went to her. She's a smart one in my household. Uh, thank you, Heather. Uh, uh, so, so you can make sure that if you do use Tithely, that you can do that uh, through Tithely or our buckets. Or we'll also be doing uh, some special stuff as we go through December as well. Uh, so with that said, uh, let's go ahead and end in a word of prayer. And I encourage you, don't forget to come back out tonight as well. Let's pray, folks. Uh, Father, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for the hope. Father, that we have. Father, the hope that we have in you and you alone. Uh, when everything seems um, just in chaos, when everything seems like it might be falling apart, when, when things just aren't the way that we think they should be going, Father, you're not surprised. And Father, as long as we keep our hope in you, Father, that's... That's the, the main of the main, Father. And I pray that you continue to burn that into us, Father, uh, that you are our hope and nothing else. Father, lead us and guide us in that. And Father, I ask that, that as we go through uh, the coming uh, month, Father, of Lottie Moon, that, that, that you will be glorified through this offering. Father, just like you are glorified through our giving today, Father, as we celebrate our offerings and our on, and our ties today dear lord father that that you be glorified in all of it father because that's that's our praise of you father that's our worship of you and father i ask that you now lead us and guide us as we walk out the store as we go up and down the roads father in our own directions father that you just lead us and guide us everything that we do father lead us and guide us our words our actions our movements father may they be for your honor and your glory only and again father we thank you and we love you so very much. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.